Welcome to the Cadigo ISN webinar on coronary artery and valvular diseases and chronic kidney disease. I'm Kristen Newby, and I'll be your moderator this morning. I'm a professor of cardiology at Duke University Medical Center and was a participant in the recent Cadigo Controversies Conference on this topic, which will serve as the backdrop for our presentation this morning. Our speaker is Dr. Mark Sarnak. He is Chief of the Division of Nephrology and Professor of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. His research focuses on traditional and non-traditional cardiovascular disease risk factors and chronic kidney disease, cognitive function and chronic kidney disease, and novel biomarkers of chronic kidney disease. He was a co-chair of the recent Cadigo Controversies Conference. He's funded by the NIDDK and the NIA and is a previous uh, Garabed Eknoyan awardee of the National Kidney Foundation. He was on the steering committee for both the Cadigo Controversies Conference on Heart Failure and Chronic Kidney Disease and Blood Pressure and Chronic Kidney Disease and is currently a steering committee member of the Cadigo Blood Pressure Guideline Update that will take place in 2019. He's going to provide insights from the recent Controversies Conference, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sarnak in just a moment. I'd like to remind the audience that you have the opportunity to ask questions at any time during the presentation or after the presentation, um, and I will be monitoring those, and we will ask those questions back to Dr. Sarnak during the last 20 minutes of the webinar. Dr. Sarnak. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Newby. Um, what I I'm going to be presenting today is just a general overview of this KDGO controversy conference. It was a, a very, uh, as I'll explain to you, it was a, a very big conference with a lot of data, and I think it's impossible to really go through all of it, but I'll try to focus on um, some aspects um, that I think would be um, of interest to the audience. Um, I'm presenting this on uh, behalf of our entire steering committee and my co-chair, Tom Marwick, um, who's a cardiologist um, on the group. Um, my conflicts, I'm on an executive steering committee uh, of a company called Akibia. Um, I don't think, I don't believe it's necessarily relevant to this uh, presentation. So, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the process um, that we undertook um, to arrive at some of the conclusions that I'm going to give to you. And I think, um, you know, we are currently writing this up, so I wouldn't say anything that I present today is exactly the way it will uh, come out uh, when we ultimately um, submit it for publication. But these are many of the themes that came up. So. The goal of the, con the conference was to present the current state of evidence um, regarding um, CAD and valvular disease and kidney disease, um, outline some controversies and unknown um, issues in this field, and also develop ideas for future research so we can move the field forward. Uh, we chose a steering committee, and I'll get to that in a couple of slides. Uh, we developed a scope of work that was then modified uh, based on um, public commentary. And uh, we invited approximately 70 participants from all around the wor world. Approximately 50% were cardiologists, 50% nephrologists, um, but those percentages are not exactly right. We had some pathologists, we had some ICU expertise, uh, pharma pharmacological expertise, etc. And then we held a two and a half day meeting uh, this was held in Vienna uh, earlier this year. Um, there were six plenary talks. Um, basically, were themes for each of the um, groups that I'll discuss in the next slide. Um, we had five small groups, and they met about three times for two to three hours each time to discuss the questions posed. And uh, they presented preliminary results uh, to the entire group, or you know, all 70 participants. Uh, received some feedback, they modified their presentations, and then uh, represented um, on the final morning. So this this was our steering committee. 
and um, as I said, there were five small groups. The, the first group focused on epidemiology and screening. Each group had a, a co-chair that was either a cardiologist or a nephrologist, or in one of the groups uh, could have also been a pathologist. So in the first group, Jonathan Craig was the nephrologist with uh, Mark Hlatke as the cardiologist. And uh, Kirsten Amman was uh, is a pathologist, and Ulf Landmeister was the uh, cardiologist involved in the second group, which pathology and pathophysiology. Diagnosis and treatment were David Chariton and Sripal Bangalore, who, um, and valvular disease, Alan Jardin and Jose uh, Cavalcante. And then in transplant was uh, John Gill and our moderator, uh, Kristen Newby. Um, we're going to primarily focus on the first three groups just because of um, time limitations. So let's just talk about um, each of the breakout groups and what the goals were and what were the populations they were studying. Uh, studying. So breakout group one uh, focused on all stages of CKD, not transplant. And similarly, this was for gray, uh, breakout group two, three, and four. Uh, group five focused on transplant itself. Um, the breakout group one, you know, were particularly interested in epidemiology, screening of CAD and of valvular disease. As I said, I don't, I'm not focusing on uh, valvular disease itself in this talk. Group two was pathology and pathophysiology of CAD and valvular disease. Group three was diagnosis and treatment of prevalent CAD. Uh, group four was treatment of prevalent uh, diagnosis and treatment of prevalent valvular disease and the last group focused on transplant recipients. So as you can see, it's a, it's a very broad topic and, you know, I'm sure people will have uh, many questions that I don't focus on here and you're welcome to bring those up um, after I finish uh, the presentation. So let's uh, talk initially about uh, group one. And I'm going to focus on four general features uh, um, in group one. And the, the first thing was just general epidemiology of uh, coronary disease in patients uh, with kidney disease or of cardiovascular disease on a more broad sense in those with kidney disease. A second topic was presentation with CAD. How does this, um, how is this different? in those um, who have CKD? Do they present in a different way? Um, we discussed some on risk prediction of CAD, um, how good are risk equations to um, estimate uh, incidence of CKD in, in those with CKD and end-stage renal disease. And I'll provide just one slide on screening. Um, as I said, what I'm doing is, you know, very broad um, strokes um, discussion of these issues. So this is just talking about uh, prevalence of cardiovascular disease in in ESRD patients uh, from the USRDS, and I can give you, you know, other slides of uh, patients with CKD, you know, that look at coronary disease or valvular disease in patients with ESRD or CKD, and essentially. As, as uh, I'm sure everyone knows, just a high prevalence of coronary disease, history of AMI or acute myocardial infarction in hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis patients. And even if I showed you um, uh, CKD patients, also, you know, an increase in all of these things with the increase starting usually when the GFR is about 60, but, you know, uh, linearly increasing as you uh, as you reach um, end stage renal disease. So high prevalence. Um, I'm not going to show you the incidence, but there's also a, a high incidence in dialysis patients. If you look at what happens to dialysis patients, this was data that uh, you know we undertook already many years ago, and it's looking at all types of cardiovascular mortality in dialysis patients, and essentially it was comparing on the top part of the curve. Um, I don't, I don't know if you can see my arrow. I, I'm not sure about that. But the top part of the curve is all dialysis patients. The entire bottom part of the curve is all um, non-dialysis patients. And this is comparing cardiovascular mortality in all dialysis patients versus everyone in the general population. 
And what you can see in the younger age, this, this is a log scale on the y-axis, you're approximately 500-fold more likely to die from cardiovascular disease if you're a dialysis patient uh, compared to someone in the gen general population. And it doesn't make a difference if you're black, white, uh, male, or female. And if you, comp and, um, if you compare a dialysis patient um, um, at a young age, at the age of 25 to 34, and you, you know, extrapolate a line all the way to the general population, that's almost the equivalent of an 85-year-old in the, in the general population. So there's just an extremely high case fatality rate of all cardiovascular disease, as well as, you know, a patient who has an MI, just high case fatality after that uh, MI. If you look at the earlier stages of CKD, this was uh, old data of ours from the ARIC study. And what you can see as the GFR gets below somewhere between 60 and 90, there's just an exponential increase in the risk of developing. In this case, it was atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but it's very similar with um, um, coronary artery disease itself. Um, Obviously, much stronger relationships in the orange part of the curve when it's unadjusted, but all of these relationships remain significant in uh, multivariable um, adjusted analysis. So CKD itself, well accepted, high risk group uh, for all cardiovascular outcomes. If you consider the other component of CKD um, separate from GFR, um, albuminuria, we, we see very similar findings and I'm not going to reproduce that. So um, these were two themes that came out of uh, future research in the epidemiology. One is the need for population-based cohorts of individuals uh, with kidney disease at late stages. So uh, we have a lot of data in the dialysis population. We're now starting uh, big studies in late stages of CKD. Examples would be the Crick study or the German CKD study. And I'm sure there are many others all around the world. Um, but um, as we know, some of the relationships change as you move through the stages of CKD, and there's lots for us to learn um, as we evolve through the stages. Also, um, longitudinal studies in the earlier stages, as you're transitioning into CKD, as you initially be uh, obtaining GFRs uh, less than 60, and examples would be you know, from Kaiser and other general population studies. Uh, one theme, that, another theme that came up was the need for standardization of clinical endpoints, and particularly as it related to composite endpoints um, and differentiation among endpoints that may be due to different mechanisms. And I'll come back to this a little bit uh, later. When we think about CKD, um, uh, the type of kidney disease, uh, the type of cardiovascular disease in CKD, we've got to be thinking about atherosclerotic, heart failure, arrhythm, uh, arrhythmic or arrhythmogenic, and often this all gets lumped into these outcomes, but the mechanisms for each may be separate, uh, different, and we need to come up with consistent definitions for patients with kidney disease that are susceptible to several of these uh, cardiovascular outcomes. So I'll now move to the, the second part of this, which is the presentation uh, with CAD and CKD. And I can discuss some of the studies if we have time or if people have specific questions. But as we go through the talk, I'm going to be giving slides that say what is known, what is unknown, what are things that we may want to be studying in the future. So, and things that I've said are known for the most part have been reproduced in, in, in several studies. So patients with CKD, and this is primarily as your GFR gets below 45, they're actually more likely to present with AMI uh, than uh, stable angina. And this, this is true, you know, through, as you go uh, below uh, GFR of 45. Patients with CKD and end-stage kidney disease who present with AMI are much more likely to have atypical presentation. So they uh, often don't have chest pain. They may just have shortness of breath. They may just have nausea. And they also frequently have non-diagnostic uh, EKGs. And this is because they have a tremendous uh, prevalence of LVH by the time they start dialysis. And that prevalence of LVH increases um, as your GFR declines. 
Um, with advancing CKD, there's a higher likelihood that the patients start presenting with non-ST elevation MI versus ST elevation MI. So this is not saying that the ST elevation MI is uh, the absolute uh, isn't an absolute increase as your GFR declines, but just the proportions kind of change as your GFR declines. And I'll show you a slide after this that uh, the clinical transitions that occur between advanced CKD and end-stage kidney disease where, you know, heart failure and non-atherosclerotic events become more frequent compared to these atherosclerotic events. This is one uh, slide from the USRDS, and it's actually looking at ST elevation MI and non-ST elevation MI uh, by different time periods. And you can see the non-ST elevation MI are increasing over time. I think part of this is due to um, how S these non-ST elevation MIs are defined. You know, we're measuring troponins more frequently. But either way, in dialysis, these non-ST elevation MIs are more uh, common uh, compared to the ST elevation MI in comparison uh, uh, with the general population. This is a, a slide from a review by uh, Wana et al. And uh, w what you can see as you move along the, the green line, which is stages of uh, uh, CKD, um, in the bottom part of the, the figure, you know, as, as your GFR declines, as I said to you, there's a higher case fatality after you have the event. So after you have that event, the chances of you dying after that, you know, increase as your GFR declines. But also, as your GFR declines, you get you you have an increase in all of these atherosclerotic events. But as you decline more, you start having a lot of these also non-atherosclerotic non CVD. Some of these are surrogates like LVH and things like that, and valve cal calcification. But others include you know sudden cardiac death. I think you could argue heart failure could be included in this uh, figure. Heart failure becomes very highly prevalent as your GFR declines and is associated with uh, with bad outcomes. So what are ideas, uh, what are some of the ideas for future research as uh, we went through this? The pathophysiology of differential presentation versus preserved uh, kidney function. I don't think we know the reasons for this. Is it related to autonomic dysfunction? Is it related to type of plaques? Uh, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, small vessel disease in the setting of LVH, exactly why that would make the presentation different uh, is less clear. You know, there was some interest in intradialytic hypotension. Is this a manifestation of uh, potentially um, CAD itself or abnormalities in the ventricle? And future directions, uh, you know, uh, may include some studies of pathophysiology of these differential symptoms, how accurate EKG changes are. For diagnosis of acute MI and uh, you know optimal pathophysiology and optimal workup for intradialytic uh, hypotension. If we then move into the next topic, which is risk equations, um, this is a, a study from the CKD Prognosis Consortium, and I think uh, and they've you know. Um, meta-analyzed multiple cohorts that have submitted data to the group. And so it's a big group of patients uh, with CKD. And as, as we all know, um, as your AC, on the left-hand side of the figure, as your GFR declines, high risk of cardiovascular disease and coronary disease, and as your ACR uh, increases, higher risk of cardiovascular disease and, um, and coronary uh, artery disease. But what they were particularly interested in is how much do these kidney uh, components of CKD add to um, risk? In other words, AUCs um, and C statistics. And what you can see is that uh, when you look at uh, the cohorts that had albumin to creatinine ratio, and if we particularly focus on coronary heart disease outcomes, you know, um, EGFR adds. Um, by increasing the C statistic, as does uh, proteinuria, as well as their combination. These are not big numbers, but when you start off with a C statistic of 0.7, it's very hard to improve this. And if you, if, uh, this is just an interesting point, if you say took out diabetes from the beginning, you know, the ACR will have more of an effect uh, than the diabetes. It's just that, 
we have these risk equations that you know were developed in the in in the past and we're trying to add to that but if you look at the relative importance of say acr compared to diabetes it will compare uh, favorably and similarly uh, with gfr this is a similar kind of uh, figure um, looking at how important CKD is compared to, you know, diabetes and smoking, which are very strong risk factors. And this is looking at uh, the combined ARIC and CHS populations. It's an older study of ours. And, and you can see in certain populations, like in black men or in black women, CKD is a much stronger risk factor for developing coronary disease than is uh, diabetes. Diabetes in, you know, in these bars, the CKD being the black, uh, the black bars, and also much stronger than smoking. And this is true even if you, you create the best models to predict uh, coronary disease, you know, using um, adjusted Framingham risk equations. However, if you look at a CKD cohort, so in other words, people only with CKD, and you look at how good are like the Framingham risk equation to predict outcomes. I don't show the data over here, but if you take all the traditional Framingham risk factors and try and predict coronary outcomes, um, C statistics are you know between 0.6 and 0.7, which are not great. So the Framingham risk equation has pretty poor discrimination in kidney disease. And this is just a slide of calibration. So it's looking at observed events versus uh, predicted events. And you can do it calibrated or non-calibrated. And what you can see is that in CKD, we, d we don't calibrate that well. Part of the reason is the events are, are much more frequent. So you can recalibrate and get a little bit better numbers in the dark brown compared to the blue, but um, still issues with um, calibration um, in CKD cohorts. And we haven't developed, you know, um, um, prediction equations in CKD that will, that will be um, applicable. Um, what, uh, what needs to happen is, you know, uh, the coefficient for blood pressure, for diabetes, all of these things will potentially change. There may be some other variables that would be included in, in the equations, including obviously GFR and, and ACR at the least. If we think about prediction equations in dialysis, I think we're all aware that you know many of the traditional risk factors just act in the opposite way. So, so this is like cholesterol, and those patients with lower cholesterol have the highest mortality on the left-hand side of of the figure. Um, and if you look at blood pressure itself, uh, it's the same thing. So lower blood pressure on the left-hand side of the figure in dialysis patients is the risk factor, not the high blood pressure. So clearly in dialysis patients, things like the Framingham risk equation are, are going to be terrible. And if we want to try and predict coronary events, we, we need to um, uh, we need alternative equations. So uh, future research in this area. So we need to adapt uh, widely accepted atherosclerotic risk predictors to the CKD population. And things that we may want to do is add CKD specific terms, uh, learning from other cohorts. We may uh, assess further need for refitting the model. So the coefficients may be different based on each of the traditional risk factors. And we may want to add novel risk factors. There may be some things that are particularly important in CKD, whether it be markers of calcium phosphorus metabolism, BNP, troponins, etc. And then in the end stage kidney disease, we have to, you know, start from the beginning. Um, and whenever we think about outcomes and developing prediction equations, we need to think: Can we use composites? especially when there's potential different mechanisms for each of the cardiovascular outcomes in dialysis, or do we need specific quick equations for, say, heart failure, sudden cardiac death, MI, et cetera? Um, and we discussed uh, some about transplant in the last, uh, uh, but I'm not going to focus on that. As I said, I've got one slide on CAD screening in CKD. I think the important thing is CAD is common and serious in, in asymptomatic CKD patients. I've emphasized that. But screening tests for asymptomatic CAD appear to be less discriminating and effective uh, 
in the CKD or the end stage kidney disease population. So um, if we screen in the same way that have been recommended in the general population, we may be um, we may be even less accurate in the CKD population. And there's no evidence that coronary revascularization is effective in any asymptomatic population, let alone um, uh, more effective. So, um, in other words, high-risk diabetics. There's no there's no evidence that we should be screening in that population. So. I think based on our review of this, screening for CAD is not recommended either in the general population or in other high-risk populations or in CKD. I, I mean, it may be correct, but uh, we don't have data to, to suggest that. I'm going to go through pathology relatively briefly, but I'll just focus on a few things that uh, we were interested in. So um, we were interested in... Um, pathology of uh, CAD comparisons with the, uh, the general population, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, calcification. We talked some on uh, uh, plaque uh, vulnerability. So here's one slide just uh, from a, a manuscript about nine years ago, just looking at coronary artery intimal plaque calcification. And uh, at the top of the slide is the different stages of CKD. And what you can see is that calcification uh, in this, in the intima of the coronary disease, this, uh, the coronary artery, this is in uh, actually in autopsies, um, is increased as your uh, kidney function declines. So I think we're all aware that there's increased calcification of these blood vessels as your your kidney function declines. When we we're learning a lot about calcification in the general population, and this was a review from uh, Jack uh, this year. And I'm not going to go through the whole slide, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of research going on in understanding the different types of calcification, um, the histological calcification, where you have no calcification to sheets and nodular calcification, versus um, how we image for calcification. You know, whether it be your your CT or your ultrasound or just by uh, radiograph or autopsy. And, you know, there's a general feeling that as you get more calcified, you know, maybe this is more consistent with more stable multi-vessel disease and perhaps um, less likely for, um, you know, acute rupture and maybe the, um, you know, the calcification may even have some uh, stabilization uh, effects. And in general, you know, those with diffuse calcification tend to be older. So the exact question the question is exactly where does kidney disease fit into all of this? In general, we think for the most part it's going to be on the right hand side of this figure, you know, frequently at least in dialysis we'll have multivessel disease, the patients will be older, they got extensive uh, calcification. But this, you know, hasn't been studied as in as much detail in in CKD. Um Another area related to the pathology that's uh, becoming uh, more interesting uh, recently, and this was a, just a editorial by Libby in the European Heart Journal last year, talking about different types of uh, acute uh, thrombus and white thrombus versus red thrombus. And um, the reason why these are maybe different, the red thrombus is your uh, classic um, you know, occlusive thrombus, probably more likely uh, with the ST elevation MI, although I don't think we are 100% sure about this, versus the white thrombus, which, you know, is more just due to an erosion rather than a, a plaque um, rupture. Um, and the question is, where does kidney disease fit into these uh, these two categories? And I don't think we, we know that. Um, um, and so these are obviously areas of uh, of interest and areas for for future research. So some of the research questions related to pathology. This one was interesting. Is the increased calcification of the media in the coronaries in CKD, um, or is all the calcification that we see on that EBCT actually intimal calcification of the of the um, 
meaning plaque and not just uh, medial uh, calcification. And this was kind of uh, a little bit of a controversial area in, in, in the literature because we don't have that much pathology. Um, we talked about how to target inflammation and senescence, which appear to be primary drivers for this calcification. We talked about plaque erosion or rupture in the CKD spectrum. How do these relate to type 1 versus type 2 uh, MI? Um, is the type of dialysis you do relevant to being at risk for these things and different forms of pathology? How does transplantation affect these issues? And then sudden death, which we know is a big issue, at least in dialysis patients, is this, um, C, is this a manifestation of CAD or is this a, uh, primarily a, um, an arrhythmic uh, event versus an ischemic event? So now I'm going to, in the last uh, 10 um, or so, 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, primarily focus on diagnosis and treatment questions. And I'll focus on two, two areas uh, that we discussed um, like I said, these are two that I, I've chosen. Um, one was diagnosis of coronary disease, and this includes uh, functional um, testing and, and troponins. And the second was uh, treatment of CAD and, you know, asymptomatic versus symptomatic patients, you know, me optimal medical therapy versus not what type of uh, revascularization should we be using in our CKD patients. Um, so it turns out we actually have quite a bit of data on on testing in dialysis patients um, for patients who are transplant candidates. You know, it was kind of clear that in those patients who are asymptomatic and are not transplant candidates, they don't get um, stress tests, and we so we don't have as much data in them. But those the patients who are um, uh, potential transplant candidates, we have a lot of types of um, testing. And I think important to acknowledge right from the outset that, you know, we have different types of uh, te testing, whether, whether it be myocardial perfusion uh, imaging uh, versus assessment of the, uh, the structure of the arteries like uh, um, coronary CTA or something like that. And when we think about stress testing, it's all, uh, stress testing it's always useful to, um, um, or, or the imaging, it's always useful to think, why are we doing them? Are we actually trying to determine what the coronaries look like under angiogram, which is presumably the gold standard, or are we trying to assess the prognosis um, after the transplant? And tests may have different, um, you know, there may be one test like a CTA, presumably would be good at telling us the structure, um, of that uh, coronary artery, but maybe the um, the myocardial perfusion imaging or the stress echo will be better for for prognosis. So I think you always got to think of the actual goals of of the test that you're doing. And this is just um, one particular study that shows you sensitivities and specificities of all of these tests for a gold standard um, angiography, so not uh, for prognosis. And when you look at um, um, types of um, stress imaging, you can do dobutamine stress echocardiography versus myocardial perfusion uh, scintigraphy in kidney transplant recipients. You know, some studies suggest that, you know, the stress echo may be a little bit uh, better, but this is not, uh, I, I wouldn't say this is consistent uh, throughout the literature. And I think in general, we've recommended do the studies that your particular center is uh, best at. And, you know, um, I don't think it's a, 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 although some may suggest, you know, stress echo is done better in some studies. I don't think that's uh, universal. So let's talk about stress testing. Um, when we review the literature, what is known? So I think this is pretty clear. There's a reduced accuracy of stress testing modalities in CKD in stage kidney disease versus those without. So this is the gold standard being the anatomy or the angiography, much less accuracy in, in CKD. There's uh, both false positive and false negative results. Tests do have prognostic value. So if you have a stress test and it's abnormal, 
that's bad. Or if you have a stress test and you've got a fixed defect or something, that, that's associated with bad prognosis. So these tests do have prognosis, but they're not as accurate as they are in the general population. Important to recognize if you've got a normal test in CKD, you're still much higher risk than the general population. So if you have a completely normal stress test before your transplant, it's not completely uncommon that that person will still have an event um, um, afterwards. So they just much higher risk patients, partly because the tests are not uh, optimal. Uh, reduced exercise capacity, obviously, in CKD, and you've got a lot of these baseline EKG abnormalities. So we usually recommend not only stress EKG, but also um, um, imaging as well, because the EKGs are frequently um, abnormal uh, to start. So what's not known? Can ancillary, uh, ancillary markers improve stress test accuracy, you know, e.g. a troponin or something? Is exercise capacity prognostically important, right? This is always a question that's asked in the general population. Um, you know, how many METs do you reach, et cetera? In CKD, this is not studied as well. How does test purpose, you know, as I've discussed with you, prognostication versus identification of, you know, um, structural CAD impact the choice of testing? The choice of testing. How should test results be used? Again, for uh, think of what you're um, looking for and what you want, how you want to use it. How does the pre-test probability impact test choice? And um, as I said, there's uh, all these stress tests that we have, the literature is all in pre-transplant. What about a dialysis patient who's um, not pre-transplant? Is it the same or is that a sicker group? And, you know, the accuracy may be even less. Future directions, utility of PET and quantitative blood flow imaging, you know, uh, uh, flow reserve and things like that, role of non gadolinium stress MRI. These are things that are being developed in the general population, not studied that much in CKD. And as I mentioned, uh, accuracy in non uh, pre transplant uh, candidates. Uh, use of troponins uh, in the diagnosis of CKD, so elevation at baseline, uh, is the frequent elevation. So this is accepted. Yeah, high prevalence of abnormalities, and those elevations pro provide prognostic information. Multiple studies show that if you've got ACS or you don't have ACS, the higher it is, the worse you do. Higher levels are associated with obstructive CAD, but also they also reflect LV mass and volume status. And uh, I think this is quite well accepted that uh, the way we diagnose MI is in a CKD and dialysis, particularly our dialysis patients, are changes. So you've got to look at the dynamic changes in someone who suspected ACS. What is not known, should baseline elevation trigger subsequent testing? There's no studies that have assessed that. And what is the predictive value of an elevated uh, uh, high sensitivity troponent to predict the actual structural um, abnormality? We discussed, should you actually do an annual troponent so you have that baseline? And will this uh, affect how we treat uh, the patient? And when would we do this baseline uh, troponin test? And how do we rule out the MI very quickly in a, in a dialysis patient? You know, what thresholds do we need? And what kind of delta change will be reassuring that this patient is really not having uh, ACS? So in the last part of the talk, I'm just going to focus um, on some treatment-related um, aspects. And um, so when we talk about treatment and uh, to prevent coronary disease and for treatment of coronary disease, I think from the outset, we've got to recognize that our patients are excluded from trials. So this is the most recent review that I've seen on this published in JAMA Internal Medicine or the Archives of Internal Medicine. And it basically just tells us that, you know, uh, patients with CKD are in excluded from a lot of these um, studies. So if you take a look at calcium channel uh, uh, anticoagulant-related studies, third from the bottom, you know, if you've got CKD, 90% of the time you're excluded from the trial. So this is our biggest limitation. You know, the people who design the trials and the meds know that people with CKD are at highest risk. So when you're coming up with a new med, you, you know, you don't want uh, bad outcomes. So this is what we have to deal with and try and uh, 
make it a requirement that patients with CKD are included in these trials. This is just more data on um, exclusion and reporting of CKD. So uh, if you look over here, CKD is frequently not even reported, like in a table one in some of these these trials. So other people are not as interested in it as <laughs> as we are. Um, and then if you've got CKD by whatever definition over here, you know, half of the patients are just excluded from the outset. So just going to show one slide on dyslipidemia. I think uh, you've all seen this. Um, this is uh, one one uh, treatment in CKD where we have in patients uh, with, uh, we have a treatment to prevent atherosclerotic outcomes. This is azetamibe and simvastatin, and uh, in the SHARP trial and reduced uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular outcomes. There's some debate about the interaction in the trial and things like that. But in general, our recommendations, and I'm not, I can certainly discuss them later, are that statins are a lipid agent of choice. We should treat all patients with CKD three to five who are not on dialysis, who are over 50 years of age with a statin. And I can discuss in more detail if people are interested why how, how these recommendations came up. Where there's no target, but there's no evidence to initiate treatment in those on dialysis. And this is based on other studies, um, including 4D and Aurora, et cetera. Regarding revascularization, what's known in non-CKD? And this is a dense uh, slide, but it's um, basically general population uh, recommendations. Um, if you've got stable CAD and you've got uh, optimal medical therapy, but persistent angina, you may want to revascularize. And then obviously there's certain populations that may do better if you revascularize. If you've got unstable angina or ACS or uh, MIs, et cetera, you know, generally early invasive, if you've got refractory angina and instability, et cetera, some recommendations even to not include patients with kidney disease in some of these early revascularization. So this is general population, just uh, general guidelines. If we think about, and I'm just going to show a few slides of this, of treatment of CAD in uh, CKD and end-stage kidney disease, and this is um, looking at observational data, right? So the, the, the thing over here is that looking at, uh, you know, 6,000, uh, what, 14,000 people total who get different procedures for the uh, coronary disease, and what you can see is in long-term follow-up, those who get the cabbage tend to live the longest. They tend, most of these studies tend to show they have the highest risk of, of early events. And this is a, a, another study that uh, compared long-term survival of cabbage versus PCI among dialysis patients, early events in the dialysis patients, but then um, uh, tend to be a better survival in the long term. So what is known about this is that non-dialysis CKD patients, they have short-term, higher risk of death, with cabbage versus PCI long-term. The CKD patients in general, they do about the same from the death standpoint, but they have higher MIs and repeat revascularization if you have a PCI versus a cabbage. In dialysis patients, also adverse outcomes short-term with the cabbage, death or stroke, in the long-term they do better. The problem with all of these data is they're, they're all non-randomized and they're all subject to selection bias. So you know, depending how much you believe you can adjust for these things, um, you come to your conclusions. But I think there's a lot of indication bias. And, you know, there's some patients, the surgeon will just say, I'm not doing a, a bypass. And that person will be forced to get a PCI, and that will be the sickest patient that you can't adjust for. Revascularization and for stable CAD. So what is optimal medical therapy? What is the benefit of revascularization to improve uh, prognosis? you know, how you deal with this upfront risk and other competing risks. What's the value of in early invasive therapy? Um, you know, if you do the PCI versus the cabbage in the CKD patients, you know, their kidneys may uh, shut down more likely in one versus the other. And then other big outcome is mortality and CV. And then for left main disease, uh, PCI versus cabbage, you know, how does this uh, affect prognosis, risk of AKI if you're a CKD patient? The last uh, issue I'm going to just uh, quickly focus on that was uh, kind of controversial is obviously there's a literature coming out 
that uh, using radial axis uh, for uh, an additional arterial uh, vessel for for cabbage, and this you know New England Journal paper that suggests that those with the radial artery had uh, reduced amount of the composite outcome death myocardial infarction if you use the radial artery versus the saphenous vein. Turns out in the renal insufficiency group, um, those hazard ratios were actually opposite, interestingly enough. And then, you know, people are also using radial versus femoral access for, for cardiac catheterization. And this was a big study published in Lancet in 2015. And those patients who you use the radial access you know, do better and have less all-cause mortality, MI, and stroke. Now, the reason why this is relevant to CKD is, as as you know, we all think our dialysis access is um, extremely important. And how does you know using, or well, if you use the radial access for the bypass, you're clearly not going to be able to use it for a fistula. And if you use it for a catheterization, or you may be losing a potential future. Uh, access for AVF or, or, or something like that. So this is where we come into this literature and, you know, at what stage of kidney disease may you be reluctant to use a radial access uh, for catheterization. So I've gone, you know, a couple of minutes um, over. Um, this is just one trial. So we are doing some trials in CKD and this is uh, called um, from the ischemia, the ischemia trial, which is a big trial of optimal, op, optimal medical therapy, uh, we, there's a CKD component of the 750 patients. Ischemia, GFR, uh, these patients have GFR less than 30 or on dialysis, and, you, and we're going to evaluate, I shouldn't say we, the investigators are going to evaluate um, is optimal therapy as good as cath and, and optimal revascularization. Future directions, CKD-specific trials of optical, uh, optimal medical therapy, CKD-specific trials of revascularization, um, get the patient involved in these management strategies, should we be using multi-arterial grafts, as I uh, hinted at, and uh, CKD-specific data on use of radial access for uh, PCI. So I wanted to thank everyone. Uh, I wanted to thank the KDGO leadership and the organizers, all of those in orange on this slide who are very uh, helpful in um, in organizing the conference and enabling it uh, to happen. Uh, participants of the conference, steering committee members, including Dr. Newby and, and, and sponsors. Thank you very much. So thank you, Mark. That was a terrific um, overview. Um, let me remind um, the audience that if you navigate to your control panel and select questions, you can type in questions for um, Dr. Sarnak um, to address, um, and I'll be monitoring those. I'm going to start um, uh, with one question, Mark, since we've got a, a little bit of time, um, and, and since the, um, the, the title of our session was um, coronary disease and um, valvular disease. I, I wonder if I could impose on you to just say one or two things about valvular disease in CKD patients. And in particular, I think um, thinking about aortic um, disease. Yeah, so I think, um, right. So we, we discussed valvular disease in several components in this conference. There was a whole uh, valvular section, as we said, for diagnosis and treatment, but then we discussed it in the pathology as well and in the epidemiology. So there's a, a very high uh, prevalence of um, um, abnormalities in the valve as the kidney function declines. And this starts off with calcification mitral valve and the aortic valve. And I think um, um, what we see is um, a lot more of um, aortic stenosis that progresses much quicker, particularly in our dialysis patients, and maybe partly due to abnormalities in calcium and phosphorus metabolism. So clinically, I've occasionally seen these patients have you know normal echoes, and a year or two later, um, 
with poor phosphorus control, high PTH, and the next thing they've got uh, severe aortic stenosis and calcified valves and very hard to treat. And uh, there's also a lot of abnormalities on the mitral valve, mitral regurgitation. So all of the high prevalence of all of these um, type of things. The one thing, interesting uh, topic uh, we addressed in the valvular group, which is obviously, um, you know, which of these patients should we be considering alternative type of valve replacements, you know, open valve replacements, um, um, TAVR or TAVI, um, and how do patients with kidney disease generally um, do when we uh, when we do these um, novel, um, not, they're not really novel anymore, but are, are they appropriate and um, for doing these kind of procedures in in our in our old dialysis patients? And and a question um, came in related to that, and and you, I think you've partially addressed it, but but let me um, let me kind of take this a little bit further. Um, the question reads: What is your take on valve replacement in patients on dialysis? We struggled to get a surgeon agreeable to take dialysis patients to the operating room because of presumed poor outcomes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a, this is probably a, a, a universal um, issue. The um, you know what's best for the patient. Um, how is the surgeon um, being evaluated? You, you know, are they willing to take risks with certain uh, number of patients? And all of these things, unfortunately, come into consideration. Um, I think clearly uh, dialysis patients, healthy dialysis patients, should uh, get uh, valve replacement. So, um, you know, a young dialysis patient, you know, we have many of them that go through these sur surgeries um, in the past, you know, with open um, procedures and and did fine. They clearly at higher risk than someone in the general population, but they do if they get through the surgery. You know, if you're talking five uh, percent mortality or ten percent mortality, they do still got a much better chance of surviving uh, with the new valve. We are at least in my own medical center, you know, some of the more frail patients, and I think we're probably moving to even some of the less frail dialysis patients are frequently being considered at least for the aortic valve for the TAVR or, 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 the, or, or the TAVI. Um, and whether that's uh, right or wrong, and uh, I'm not... I don't think we have the uh, great data. We don't have the randomized trials in dialysis patients. There's no question that the dialysis patient with the uh, TAVI does worse than the non-dialysis patient with the TAVI. So um, I think this is a, a challenging aspect in 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 all programs. Um, and you know, sometimes uh, I think one thing that came through very clearly was that there needed to be patient-centric approaches and sometimes saying to the patient, you know, if you're 90 years old on dialysis, you know, maybe it's not the right thing to go through any type of valve replacement if you're frail and in a nursing home or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. It's not, not going to change. Um, <laughs> yeah, tough, uh, tough area for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me, let me um, direct another question um, going back to coronary disease. Um, the uh, question is, is, do you know of any plan to study differences in coronary disease between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients um, based on their exposure to um, uh, calcium, elevated or constant um, calcium levels? Yeah, that's, that's a, a, very, it's a very good question. Um, and I don't know detailed comparisons between uh, the two of them. There's um, there's a high prevalence in both PD and and HD of of all of these things. 
there's always some selection biases as to who ends up on PD versus who ends up on HD. In the US, it's often the younger person who, I mean, in the US, it's only five or 10% of people who are on PD, and that's often either the young person who can do it at home or the or the person who's failed hemodialysis. So they tend to be different groups that end up. And obviously, all of these cardiovascular outcomes happen the same. Is the mechanism going to be a little different, right? Could you say that in hemodialysis, you have stunning and intradialytic hypotension, and that causes certain type of abnormalities in the ventricle, maybe in the coronaries, whereas the PD patient may be exposed to more metabolic abnormalities, you know, with um, with a peritoneal dialysate. So it's an interesting question, and I don't think we we know the, I mean, we know there's differences in cholesterol, uh, the types of cholesterol in the two different groups. But I don't know of great data comparing the, the types of coronary disease and and calcification in the two groups. There may be data on that. I just may not be aware of it. Great. And then um, this is an interesting, uh, I think an important question um, and interesting question. Um, using tr high sensitivity troponin to diagnose, um, it says coronary disease, all, all um all interject acute coronary syndrome or MI. Um, is there any cutoff point for confirming the diagnosis in dialysis patients or with serial testing, um, how to um, confirm it? Yeah, yeah, a, a completely valid question and things that we deal with every day in, in clinical practice. And, you know, there are obviously different types of troponins and each of them may have a little bit different cutoffs. And and I think uh, <laughs> different people are, a part of the problem is they're getting checked for any reason when, at least in the US, sometimes you'll come in with a headache and you'll have the troponin, unfortunately, and then you're like, it's abnormal. What do I do with it? Why did, was it done? So I think the first thing is to try and do it under the appropriate setting. If This is why we mentioned, should there be like a baseline, right? And if you've got a baseline and its baseline is elevated and it's not changed, that's reassuring. If it's, you don't have a baseline and it's elevated, the way we diagnose it is we just check it again you know, six or eight hours later and see which way it's going. Um, and if it's increasing, you know, then we're usually going to give it a diagnosis of a non-ST elevation MI. But what kind of increase is relevant? I don't think there are any definitive standards on this. And all of us are doing this a little bit um, differently. But it's obviously an active area of research and an active area where we can you know, I think improve uh, the care of the patients. Uh, like I said, this is this is clinical practice that we're dealing with every day that troponins are abnormal. And, you know, frequently we'll just say, don't worry about that, focus on the pneumonia or something like that. Don't go look further. But uh, whether that's right, I, I don't know. Clearly when they elevated, that patient does worse in some way, whether it's uh, ACS and whether there's any reason to, go, to do a stress test or to intervene obviously depends on the other clinical characteristics that, that the patient has at that time. Yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right. And, and um, I, I think the points you made are tests in the right setting. Um, you know, elevation itself is prognostically not good. And if there's a dynamic change, and most of the algorithms for high sensitivity troponin that are available that <clears throat> have been widely used in Europe for a while <clears throat> will pick up the same kind of delta um, in uh, chronic kidney disease and or in stage kidney um, disease patients. So I think as far as we know now, um, but a lot more research needed. And then I'm going to take the liberty of one final question, because I think this is uh, interesting and a, a bit of a different perspective. Um, are you aware of any evidence that vegan diet adherence is an intervention or effective intervention for CKD patients in that it could slow progression of coronary disease or kidney disease? Yeah, that's, 
Yeah, that's a, a very interesting question, and I think probably um, there's probably some data to suggest uh, this may be helpful. I think from the kidney disease progression standpoint, um, we don't have the randomized trials. We have the randomized trials on different protein diets, uh, and I think they're not definitive. I think what we know is that red meat itself is is probably not good uh, for progression. So high red meat protein is not uh, promotes progression. Um, other components of the the uh, vegetarian diet, you know, may be helpful. You know, there's some data that high potassium diet, obviously low sodium diet, um, you know, may be good for kidney disease progression and may be good for cardiovascular disease. But I don't think we've got the trials um, on, on these uh, type of things, uh, uh, at least for the vegetarian diet itself. It's, the, the diets have been more related to you know, DASH diet versus uh, protein itself. Great. And then um, one last question, and this gets back to your comments about um, statin um, use. Um, we have a couple of questions um, on that, but I'll, I'll try to, I'll, I pick this question to kind of get the, the theme out. What is your input regarding the recent observational studies regarding statin use in dialysis patients and increased risk for coronary disease um, by worsening calcifications and higher coronary artery calcium scores? Yeah, I, okay, so uh, so coming back to those, uh, the guidelines in, in dialysis patients, I don't think, um, the guidelines generally recommend if, if you've, don't have coronary disease, don't start it in dialysis patients. And that's most of the 4D study, only 20% had coronary disease. Uh, in the Aurora, I can't remember the percentage, but I think it was about 20%. So there's no evidence that it helps. In, in, the, in the 4D study, in those who got the statins, the 4D was randomized uh, 20 milligram of atorvastatin versus placebo. The hazard ratio for the coronary events was not significant, but was in the right direction. So I personally think the statin may have some benefit if you had a big enough trial, but mo our patients are dying from many other things. They're competing risks, like I said, of, of uh, heart failure, arrhythmias, where the statins don't have any benefits. Um, and then if you've got like a coronary event, you know, someone has an MI, I think we all deal with this, the, the patient will immediately come out of the hospital on a high dose of a statin that was given by the cardiologist. I don't think we know if that has a benefit, even in the person who's had a recent event, I think most of us will continue it. So I don't think that uh, in answer to the question, I don't have, at the moment, I'm not worried about these kind of observational data on on calcification and statins having a worse outcome. I think under some circumstances, I would still uh, use the statin. In most populations, I don't think there's any benefit to the statin, although I haven't seen harm from a clinical standpoint. Terrific. So um, I want to thank um, Dr. Sarnak for an excellent presentation and for taking time to answer these questions. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over. You've been a terrific audience and um, have have put forward some excellent questions. We didn't get to all of them, um, but as you can see on your screen, if you have more questions, there's a um, website that you can um, direct those um, to. Uh, and please also um, visit the link to look for additional uh, webinars. So again, thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, terrific um, talk. Thank you to the audience. And we will conclude the webinar at this point. Thank you very much.